Good morning, everyone. My name is Jackson Vungani. Uh, I host Upfront program on The Voice of America. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Many thanks to the Atlantic Council for organizing this forum where Africa and African issues are being centered. As uh, Ambassador Yade said, Africa is the youngest and fastest growing uh, continent. Uh, the UN projects that by 2050, more than a third of the world's young population will live in Africa, and that the fourth industrial revolution will level the playing field and open doors for millions of uh, citizens, transforming the continent into a global powerhouse. So there's a consensus among uh, many development experts that tech is that great equalizer and that digital transformation will continue to change life on the continent by uh, driving innovation, creating unique African solutions for African problems, driving economic progress, creating jobs for millions of Africans, young Africans especially, who have a, a high uh, youth unemployment rates, and ultimately reducing poverty uh, as most societies aspire to become middle income. And so this morning, our panelists will talk about some of the work they're doing uh, in their respective uh, capacities to reframe this narrative on African successes around digital innovation. We're going to hear some of uh, uh, the emerging technologies or trends that are playing a significant role in the future of Africa and African digital uh, transformation. And on our panel today, I'll start with uh, Mr. Fernando Loreiro. He's the Executive Director of Government Affairs for Latin America and Africa at Intel. Uh, Fernando, welcome. Uh, Henry Nyakarundi, a fellow Rwandan, uh, flew in all the way from Kigali yesterday. Good to see you. As you can see, we're you know, matching shirts. Uh, we apologies for unleashing on you guys uh, our fashion. Um, but like we said, the creative industries in Africa really blossoming. Um, we also have uh, Rebecca Harrison, all the way from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Habari? Asante. Uh, Asante. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca is the CEO and co-founder of the African Management Institute, which is a tech-enabled social enterprise that is uh, pioneering scalable skills and enterprise development in Africa. And thanks to all of you all for joining us, and uh, I look forward to an edifying discussion this morning. I'm going to start with you, Henry. Uh, you know, digital transformation is a critical and evolving issue and topic, especially in the context of Africa, where various regions are experiencing rapid uh, technological advancements. Uh, let's start with you talking about your company, Arid, and then talk to us about your view of the current status of uh, digital literacy in Africa and how it has evolved in the last uh, decade. Yeah, so briefly, um Digital innovation is a, is a huge topic, right? Uh, but to uh, give you guys a, a brief background, um, I, I grew up in, in Burundi, moved to the U.S. in 96, spent 17 years here. 2013, I decided to move back. Um, I used to go on vacation uh, from time to time on the, in Rwanda and Burundi, and I started seeing the changes from 2009 to 2012. I really realized the future was there. So. Sold, I had, a, I had a company in Atlanta, um, sold it, sold everything I had, and moved, invested. We developed a technology. At that time, it was a smart solo kiosk. And uh, we sold that tech about two years ago, and now we're working in uh, building distributed cloud infrastructure. So since COVID, um, digitization has become the norm now. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole continent is focusing uh, on how to digitize their services, so pretty much the whole ecosystem from health, education, government, uh, Rwanda has really taken the lead on, on that aspect. But what we've seen is digitization has been focused strictly on the internet. When you talk about storage, computing power, there's a huge gap on that aspect, number one. Number two, we tend to copy and paste solution from the West to the continent, which is a big, big issue because um, and that's why I'm, I'm very passionate about innovation. We, we, we need to look inward, basically. Uh, and uh, the ecosystem in, this, in Africa, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, it's totally different. But there's huge, huge opportunity when you talk about digitization. I think uh, I'll mention a few, but uh, 
uh, bridging the digital gap, uh, creating digital economy. Uh, we operate in low-income communities. Uh, we've seen how the youth is adopting di you know, digital tools, uh, digital application very quickly. But infrastructure is really what the laying ground that needs to be developed. So that's what I will, I will talk a little bit more about there. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Fernando, let's talk about Intel's uh, digitize, Digitalize Africa program. How is it partnering with local organizations uh, to build technologies uh, like artificial intelligence capacity for African policymakers? Sure. First thing, again, thank you. Good morning. And uh, yes, Intel is, and I am excited about Africa today, and even excited about Africa tomorrow, in the future, right? So yeah, digitalize is a, the economy is coming, digital, digital, digital. Everything is becoming more and more digital. So doing that, we, it needs a microprocessor chip, so that's where Intel is, right? So when we are looking to the future and seeing all this digitalization going forward, and the need to have a more microprocessors, it means not only the fabrication of that, but especially when you have a fab to do that, we need design to do that. We need R&D, you need components, you need critical minerals, you need uh, packaging. So there's so many opportunities in this task to the economy really becoming more and more digital. That's the Africa's right stands there, right? We're talking about this in 2050 being 2.5 billion. Uh, the population, one out of four people will come from Africa. We think about the young people is one out of three. So we think about young people, innovation, creativity, all the ecosystem, well, so that's what we are looking to Africa, right? So digital, digitalize uh, Africa strategic program for us, for Intel is about it. It's a kind of a three pillars, one horizontal. The three pillars, we, first is the startup ecosystem, how to work with the, the, the developers there, right? To create this ecosystem with startups. The second is uh, on the innovation and R&D side, so working closer with the academia, with the universities, and the doing centers of excellence there that we, we start and we talk more about it after. And the third is connect the unconnected, right? We have a lot of a community rich programs that we are doing, try to understand these local creative solutions that are in need to support, to make sure that they can connect and uh, they can uh, demonstrate what they are doing. And horizontally, we are working with such as a Smart Africa and uh, Afri uh, Labs and um, many partners to do the readiness, the Intel uh, or the digital readiness for, for that. So many policy makers that they need to understand the, the, the technology before going to regulations and uh, legislations. And youth, the people that will need to understand the technology to, to really make sure that we, we are tapping all of that. So for each of these, I have a, many examples, but we can leave it for the second Absolutely. round. Mm. Um, let me come to you, Rebecca. Mm. Um, you have quite an interesting story about how you started working in tech in Africa. Mm. I want you to start off by telling us a little about that story and also add a, a gendered uh, dimension to this uh, conversation about how tech has become this great equalizer mm. on the African continent. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Jackson. And apologies to Swahili speakers. Of course, the correct response to Habari is Missouri. Sana. Absolutely. You caught me off guard. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to speak Swahili here. But um, yeah, it's such a joy to be here. And um, yeah, I guess I was a bit of a late convert to, to tech in Africa, so I, I used to be a journalist sitting on the other side of these questions like you. Welcome I, to the I, other side. Thank you. I said, um, I said earlier, it's much easier answering the questions than having to think of them. So, um, but yeah, I was, I was sent to South Africa by um, Reuters news agency where I was working at the time um, in the mid 2000s. And I really thought that I would be writing about, you know, important worthy issues like HIV AIDS and humanitarian issues and politics and development, all of, all of these kind of weighty issues. And, I, and when I got there, I was told to my surprise I was going to be covering the tech beat. And this was like mid-2000s. It was before, you know, um, M-Pesa had really hit Kenya. And pesa now, of course, you know, accounts for like 20% of Kenya's GDP or something. Um, and it was before tech was really that cool in the development world. Um, and so I, I really, I was like, this, this is crazy. What am I doing writing about tech in Africa? And, and then I started to kind of visit villages around, around the country and saw, you know, young people and not so young people using mobile phones and could see 
how quickly, you know, in the West, I think mobile then start, you know, started as a luxury, but we could see how this was becoming this incredibly powerful tool in the hands of ordinary people and starting to see these very small but real innovations of, you know, people in the city sending their elderly parents money back, you know, through their phone, um, community health workers starting to send reminders about HIV medication by phone. These, like, small innovations that, of course, now, now we've got deep tech and zip line and all these amazing innovations. Mm. But back then, it became clear to me really quickly that, in fact, it wasn't big development. I'm sorry to say that in, in this context, in this room, but it wasn't big development that was going to have the biggest kind of transformative impact mm. um, in the lives of many Africans. It was, it was technology and it was the mobile phone companies at that time and the entrepreneurs innovating around them that were, were really going to... Um, uh, really going to transform the continent, largely because of this point that you're making around democratization of access. So what technology does really is democratize access to critical goods, services, products, information. Um, and so it was really based on that understanding, I shifted career to the other side of the questions um, and ended up co-founding AMI, African Management Institute, and we now leverage technology to deliver um, really practical business management tools and training to tens of thousands of entrepreneurs, leaders, young people across Africa. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Henry, let's talk about some of uh, the tech hubs, the startups we see on the continent, but specifically I wanted to, to, to talk about, you know, some specific regions or demographics that you see are still facing significant challenges in, in acquiring digital skills? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, the low-income communities is, is the community that is most affected. So we talk about internet. I, I'll give an example about Rwanda, right? Connectivity covers 94% of the country but less than 50% of the population still have access to the internet. So high cost of internet is a big issue. Mm. Uh, obviously, high cost of devices, uh, smartphones are big issues. Um, uh, you see a lot of innovation on uh, pay-as-you-go, for example, smartphone, which I think has a huge opportunity uh, on, the, on the continent. So bri we, bridging this digital gap is, is, is it's a great narrative, but we need to look inward. Like I said, we need to start looking uh, inward for solutions to solve those gaps, right? We, we, we have to understand that that ecosystem is not just about bringing internet, for example, right? Um, the youth, you don't need to train the youth about the internet. They can pick up very quickly. But now you need to find out how can you lower the cost of infrastructure? Yeah. Uh, how can you facilitate access to those devices to the people. How can you create a digital economy within those communities? That's another conversation mm -hmm. that most people don't talk about. You know, mobile apps, uh, application development, software. My background is computer science. So, um, and fundamentally, we have a mindset issue in Africa. That's our biggest issue. Uh, we look outside for solutions to solve our problems. We spend billions of dollars, whether it's AIDS and all those things, trying to solve this problem. And then after 10 years, that gap is still the same. We talk about 50% of uh, you know, people unable to connect for the last 10 years, at least the last 10 years I've been back. You know, same thing with energy. Mm -hmm. you know? So there is a problem that needs to be solved, but those, those, are the, those are the main issues. I guess what's the best, what is the one way to solve some of those problems? Looking inward. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of innovators locally that don't have access to capital. They're not heard of. Our leaders are, and when I say our leaders, I'm, I'm generalizing because every country moving differently. But eventually, we, we're looking for, I don't want to say look, but we spend so much time looking what outside is doing, thinking what it's working over there in the US, in Europe, is going to work in Africa. Mm -hmm. And the short answer, it does not work in Africa. Mm -hmm. Got to look inward. Mm -hmm. you know? We got to start listening to the local innovators that understand the community problem. Same thing with investor. I'm, I'm not gonna spend too much time on that, but the same thing. You know, we, we have to listen more to the, to the people that live in those communities and trying to solve the problem of those communities. Mm. And we're not doing that in Africa right now. So when you talk about leaders, you're talking about business leaders, no, investors, political innovators, leaders, uh, political leaders, business makers. Uh, big corporation like telecos, mm. banks, um, you know, and, and uh, that, that's the thing. And, and when you, when you look at the innovation mapping of Africa, 
there's not that many African on that uh, conversation, mm. right? Mm. So, uh, and that's also a, a narrative that needs to be changed. Okay. Mm. I'll ask both uh, Rebecca and Fernando to chime in on this question of uh, the barriers to digital transformation on the continent. What do you see as some of the barriers and how can they be overcome? Hmm. Well, uh, just because I think it's a very interesting point, what, what we did as Intel first uh, before tackling the deep tech, it was exactly, well, what is the deep tech in Africa and what is deep tech, right? So deep tech for us, is this a startups that uses really technology, merging technologies to tackle different solutions problems. And, uh, and then we are talking about AI, about our IoT, about a sensing, about a cybersecurity, about a cloud to edge computing. So essentially this kind of a together and uh, to, to propose new, new ways to, to solve problems. And then we, we, we commissioned two studies, one with uh, Afri Labs and uh, Brights to evaluate the ecosystem on the continent, where they are, what they are doing, how many they have, what is the resource they have or is lacking, so on and so forth. And the second one uh, with uh, WITS universities was to evaluate the spin-off coming from universities, from lab to market, where they are, uh, what they are doing, what kind of technology they are using, so on and so forth. So based on that, well, the gaps was very similar, or the gaps is exactly this, is kind of a lack of funding, uh, Venture capital is not there yet or structured. Uh, the R&D uh, is not there, funding. Uh, more industrial academia uh, kind of a collaboration, prepare the studies, the programs that make sense to the industries to, to hire uh, this young generation. So there's a possibility, there's a gap. And, uh, and the, the skills, there is a, a gap in Africa of the skills to create this, uh, uh, technology savvy programs, right? So, so this is kind of the gaps. And on, 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 on which one of these gaps that we perceived in 2022, that's the, the, the two students, we start doing this year some a initial programs in Africa and to understand what is going on. And uh, to not take too long, I can mention what we are doing after yeah. Rebecca. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> those, those are the challenges, okay. right? And, uh, Mm, that's a great summary of some of the macro issues. I guess I can speak a little bit from our experience working with kind of entrepreneurs, young people on the ground. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think like Henri mentioned, the, the hardware is there now. Mo you know, s smartphone proliferation is, is really good. There's great kind of cheap, like affordable models. Um, it's the access to data that can, that can be challenging. So we've found, um, for example, at, like the best way to overcome barriers to tech, and during COVID, we also saw massive acceleration of, of comfort with technology. So we used to run most of our programs were blended. So we would combine a kind of in-person sessions with online kind of access to tools so that entrepreneurs could use those in their business. We found during COVID, um, everyone just got used to, we, we ran those sessions virtually. And in fact, people, entrepreneurs much preferred it was so much more efficient, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so COVID was an accelerator, but still we found that um, our programs are most effective where we're able to combine kind of technology with some kind of human touch. And we found that particularly for women, we've done, we disaggregate all of our data um, by gender. Um, and really interestingly, we find, this might not surprise some women in the room, but um, interestingly, we found that women access our technology platform less often, um, but once they get on them, and actually for a shorter amount of time, but they're much more efficient in that, during that time. <laughs> so they'll get onto the platform, they'll find what they need immediately, they'll download more tools, they'll engage quite efficiently. Um, and and then, then they're not on there anymore. I, I thought it was kind of an interesting little fact. But, but yeah, this combination of still some kind of kind of human connection um, we found to be really powerful when combined with technology. Also designing for your users. So starting with the user rather than kind of parachuting in, you know, technology designed in Silicon Valley. So... Um, um, the designing the user, thinking about the African user when you're designing the when interface. When you're designing, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, for example, our content, most kind of um, online content that, that came out of the big kind of MOOC 
revolution, Coursera, you know, it's all talking heads that's A, really boring to look at, and, and B, takes up loads of bandwidth, right? Just choose that bandwidth to be looking at a video that doesn't add a lot of value. So we found by replacing that with kind of animation that was much lighter on bandwidth requirement and more engaging, um, really drove engagement and was much, used up a lot less data for users for whom data is, is really valuable. So just kind of small examples like that, designing for the people mm. who are gonna be using it, um, I think can really reduce access, uh, barriers to access. Good, all right, so this is a, a question for all of you. We're talking about AI everywhere these days. Um, I think this might be a moment for Africa to mm -hmm. kind of uh, take this and run with it. Henry, uh, I don't know what kind of conversations are happening right now in, in places like Kigali around mm -hmm. AI and how Africa and Africans can leverage this moment to catch mm -hmm. up. Yeah, I know, I know AI is, uh, is, has big interests. I mean, um, it, the conversation is definitely there. I know uh, Rwanda is the first uh, at least the, 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 the top countries have passed policies around AI. But to develop an industry or any sector, there has to be a certain dynamic uh, ecosystem, right? So we, we're doing very good um, in developing talent. For example, CMU is in Rwanda. We, we hire a lot of interns from CMU. Um, that's very interesting. I remember 10 years ago, finding talent was a big, big challenge. Mm -hmm. But now, what do they do? I, I, I'm not gonna just stop by AI, but let, let's talk about embedded system. Embedded system is what we do the most uh, in our company. Well, there's a lot of students you know, uh, studying embedded system now, but they're looking for companies to work and develop their skills. Now, if you don't develop that ecosystem of companies working in AI, working in embedded system, edge, then you see that the stagnant of this, the skill set, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So there has to be, we can't just talk about a topic and not develop the industry that's gonna you know, help those students develop their skill sets and even themselves go in and start their own company, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah, AI is a, is a great topic. I think there's more important topic than just AI, but um, we, we have to look at the whole ecosystem, I think, to, to, to really develop. Um, are, are we gonna lead the AI? Uh, Revolution? <laughs> Um, honestly, on the short term, no. Uh, yeah. We're not there yet. On the long run, uh, maybe some sector, but again, it has to be an AI that brings value to Africa. Again, mm -hmm. we, we need mm -hmm. to stop comparing ourselves with the rest of the world. Right. Our problems are very, well, a lot of our problems are They're unique very to unique. Africa. Yeah. Right? So we, 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 we're trying to sometimes trying to do what everybody else is doing, not focusing on the actual problems. Rebecca, I feel like you're itching to say something about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, dare to wade into the kind of deep tech of AI, but I think what's super interesting is this, the risk and opportunity that AI brings around kind of telling African stories. Um, and I, I think I was telling you just before, before this session, I, I saw a friend posted a kind of meme on LinkedIn the other day. You know, I haven't, I haven't fact checked it, but it, it seemed pretty horrifying. It was apparently she had typed in um, black African doctor treating white kids. I don't know if anyone else saw this, but into a kind of AI image generator. And the image it came back with was a white doctor treating black African kids. Um, and uh, uh, this, this um, kind of, I guess, you know, the large language models it was feeding off just it somehow could not conceive of a black African doctor treating white kids. Um, which, you know, I'm a mom of two black African boys um, who are pretty ambitious, and this is just pretty horrifying to me, um, that these models can't even conceive of this. They are so steeped in the stereotypes that we've fed them, um, you know, over, over the years. Um, and and I, I think we really need to take that seriously. How can we, those of us working on the continent, um, start to think, even if we're not leading the tech side of it, but how can we leverage these tools um, to ensure that we're feeding, that we're creating our own large language models. So for example, at AMI, we're already thinking about how can we use um, the quality assurance uh, data that we use to test our translation. So we translate into Kenya, Rwanda, um, uh, Somali, various kind of African languages. Also looking at 
Francophone um, African French, so French that, that feels relevant to Francophone Africans, how can we use those data points to generate in future kind of more efficient translation that is actually based in and kind of steeped in the continent? So, I, I mean, that's kind of a mundane example. I think there are more exciting kind of examples from what's happening in the creative industries, you know, ways that we can really ensure that we don't let this moment pass us by um, as an opportunity for, for kind of telling the stories of the continent and shifting those stereotypes. Absolutely. Shifting the narrative. Fernando, mm -hmm. do you have any? Yeah, certainly. I mean, this is, well, AI is all about data, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, have the data, the right mm -hmm. data. And we talk about responsible AI, by the way, exactly this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if I get some data that is bad, usually when you, you use it to an algorithm, mm -hmm. the outcome will be bad, right? So we need to have a good data, the, the, the right data. Uh, this is an opportunity for Africa. We have a lot of data, but they are not uh, treated. They are not, uh, uh, that, that is an opportunity for sure. So besides data, we need the computing power, right? We need the, the devices, the data center. It's not a device. Well, a, a mobile phone is good for a lot of things, but for use, mm -hmm. not to produce. And what we need in Africa is really to leverage the production, the innovation, the creativity that we have there. Mm -hmm. So the open activity is, is first thing to solve. Uh, the, the right device, but it's costly, so we need to, to solve this, how we can put the, the, the tools in the hands of a, uh, uh, the new innovators to make sure it happens. And, uh, and, and, and then the opportunity is there, right? So what we are doing as Intel, we started on these gaps that we, we, we talked about, the two, stu the, the two reports that we commissioned. It. The first was to get a workshop with venture capitals in, in Africa, across the country, say, hey, what are you doing, where you are? what's the opportunity, what is lacking, so on and so forth. But the second after that was, well, we, we started working with AfriLabs, these hubs uh, of innovation across the continent. We are doing what we call the train the trainers. So we started in South Africa, then we did in Kenya, the last one was in Egypt, so we'll continue to do that next year. These train these hubs, so they, they have the, 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 the deep tech uh, around in them, so they can create these ecosystems across the continent. It's, being very, very interesting. By the way, in the report, at least 60% of this deep tech that we, we evaluated in Africa, they are working already with AI, machine learning, sensing, uh, so computer vision. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's very surprisingly, it's amazing what Africans are doing there. And then the, 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 mad, the next thing, uh, thing that we did that was super interesting this year was, well, let's try first AI hackathon. So let's say in Africa, that are using deep tech to create solutions to Africa, right? And we put a, the venture capital uh, uh, among us. So the four winners, they get a possibility to be sponsored, access to capital. And on our side, we put on part of a global Intel uh, liftoff, we call it. This is a global program that we, we offer mentor, coach, access to tools, and uh, to, to create this ecosystem with a deep techs across the globe. Africa was not part of the Intel liftoff. Not at all. So three, see what Africa have. Mm. So in one year, this year, we have uh, only 130 companies uh, part of Intel liftoff, 11 from Africa, but 11 from Africa that was not part of the program is huge. Mm. So, I mean, the opportunity is there, but we need to, to, to work on these gaps that we still uh, identified. Mm -hmm. And one company, we started these things in 2023. Imagine what we can do going forward. Mm -hmm. And if we partner with other companies, we do more of it, these private public initiatives with universities, there's a tremendous opportunity, mm -hmm. but we need to coordinate. Absolutely, coordination is key. We'll come to the audience for some questions with our panelists, but. Uh, Henry, as a former member of uh, the African diaspora here in the US, uh, we often talk about money flowing to the continent, whether it's in FDIs, foreign aid, but a big portion comes from people like us sending money back home. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how that is driving innovation on the continent. Oh yeah, I, I'm still part of the diaspora. No? Oh, you are? Yeah, yeah no, no, I am, I am. <laughs> I learned a lot from this country, so. Uh, no, I mean, um, I think the diaspora can really be a game changer for the innovation space. I, I think it's even, I think it was mentioned on a previous panel, uh, the, the US government has a huge opportunity to tap into the diaspora if they really want to have an impact uh, it, with African innovators. Uh, the problem for, for diaspora is how do they channel the money to the right you know, companies or startups on the continent, right? 
I think, for example, one of the biggest opportunity is like having a, a crowd, you know, funding platform um, where diaspora can invest in vetted companies in Africa. There has to be a vehicle to support that type of uh, concept. I think that's uh, that's really uh, that's really important because I don't know any diaspora that's not looking for opportunity to invest in startups. I can tell you already. Even those who don't travel uh, regularly back, back home or able to, to uh, visit Africa, they're always interested in what's going on in Africa. You know, I, I can't tell you how many friends go, oh, you've been to Senegal? I heard about this, this, and that. I heard these companies doing this and this and that. Can you find me a contact to, you know, invest or talk to or what do they need? You know, so, but there's no vehicle. You know, and it's, you know, we're talking about 50 plus countries, right? Yeah. So it's going to be very difficult for a startup or a company to really build a, a platform that's going to really help uh, diaspora invest. So I think that's something that not just the U.S. government, by the way, African countries needs to look at it. But crowd investing is uh, a, a platform. Is, it's a huge opportunity. But without, the da without tapping into the diaspora, the VC space, uh, the, the, the traditional investment space is not going to do uh, much dent on the innovation space. That uh, I can tell so you. So when you talk about a vehicle, you're talking about some sort of fund? Investment fund. Okay. You know, yeah. I mean, we all know, uh, I don't think we have time to talk about it, but the VC mindset is not designed for the African market mm -hmm. as it is today. Mm -hmm. Right? I've talked to plenty of VCs. I can tell you. First of all, when you talk about Africa, they already tell you, oh, no, 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 it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's too much risk and all. Oh, most of them don't have offices in Africa. They don't understand the opportunity. They, they read a little bit more, some data points and all that, but we're not there. But diaspora, they, they're willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. And the crowdfunding platform, that's a small amount that they can invest in different companies, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you briefly, you know, for example, Prosper Africa has a deal room that we're part of, less than 3% uh, of that deal room gets investment. That's just to tell you the amount of work is needed to really have a, a dent into this uh, financial gap. Absolutely. Rebecca, we're just coming out of uh, the global pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when um, the WHO declared uh, COVID as a global pandemic way back in March 2020. Uh, you know, kind of we're all lost, scared, but more worried for Africa. Everybody's like doom and gloom, things, you know. But we came out of it, uh, we are still here, thankfully. Uh, and, you know, we learned so many lessons. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the lessons your company, your organization learned uh, coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's always, uh, it, it always feels uncomfortable to talk about kind of silver linings within COVID, doesn't it? But I, I think really a, a, a big silver lining was, was the, the accelerated adoption of technology. I mean, you, you started off talking about this, Henri, but um, um, yeah, there were just so, so many, so many of us were forced to, uh, you know, forced to get online and do things online that were perhaps outside of our comfort zone. And I think in the development community as well, there's been a, a little bit of a kind of slightly cliched, well, you know, you know, online doesn't really work in Africa, this kind of idea, like, somehow that Africans would, wouldn't, wouldn't want to kind of enjoy all the benefits of being online like the rest of the world. Um, it's odd. But, um, but, I, but I think COVID really provided the opportunity to show that that wasn't true. So, so we, um, when COVID hit, actually, so we were really worried about the number of small businesses across the continent um, who hadn't done rigorous kind of cash flow planning because we know that when businesses come into our program, that's often the thing that they, the first thing they realize they need to do. Um, so we rolled out boot camps across the continent. We had about 3,000 small businesses over, over a few months um, just kind of join free boot camps. We had kind of a couple of hundred people often online at once and just took them through this kind of um, pretty basic but, but very practical, useful cash flow modeling tool. Um, and then we realized there was this real demand for entrepreneurs to kind of connect with each other during COVID. Um, so we did another one around, around resilience and, and kind of 
adapting your business to changing customer needs. And I often look back, I think if there's one thing that we've done as a, as a company that's been the most impactful was that second boot camp on adapting to, to different needs. Because, you know, it didn't stop with COVID. After COVID, there's been, you know, depending on where, you're, where you are in the continent, there's been kind of political unrest, there's economic currency crisis, crisis yeah. there's economic, the, you know. Um, it, it doesn't stop, and so uh, in a way, it's the great, um, the great uh, strength of, of many businesses across the continent. Um, I can't remember who was talking this morning about the hustle. You know, the hustle is so real. African businesses are just brilliant at hustling, and, and it comes pretty naturally when you're in such a tough environment. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's getting more and more real, and so I, you know I think that just uh, to come back to COVID, I think that was the second big silver lining was not just acceleration of tech, but also this resilience, the mindset that, the mindset mm. that you know it really we really learned as as entrepreneurs in Africa and globally um, that the world is you know uncertainty is the new certainty. Um, and that we, we need to live with that, and you can make that a competitive advantage. And to me, that's the potential competitive advantage of a continent, in mm. a sense, is this hard scrabble kind of resilience and ability to adapt. Okay. Um, and maybe that's what will be the next big leapfrogging. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take, we have a few more minutes left in our panel. Let's take a couple of questions from the audience. One, two. You again, sir. Okay. That's fine. It's the Rwandan. Can we get some Rwandan female representation? Yeah. <laughs> the Rwandan. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I will be. I will be very quick. I just want to give flowers to Rebecca, because my startup received you. support from you, from my, uh, from your, uh, I guess, uh, Ami. Uh, they gave us like one year, because you know, startup is hard, really. Mm. And uh, being myself and African founders, go read. We receive less than 0.5% in funding. It's crazy. So thank you, Ami. So we got like one year thank of a startup you. space. So you are doing an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, my name is Kyla Denwood and I'm a student at Georgetown University. Um, my question uh, comes with this uh, when we talk about digitizing Africa, I feel like it's hard without talking about the materials that go into our digital tools, like semiconductors, which is big in the United States now. Um, and in producing these semiconductors, we're taking a lot of critical minerals from Africa without necessarily incorporating them into our advanced manufacturing processes. So I was wondering, um, from y'all's perspective, um, would incorporating Africa more in our advanced manufacturing produce a value add for the continent? And then what, are, what do we have to overcome in order to do that? How do we actually get this to happen? Mm. Right, that's one for you. Okay. There's one more question at the back. Please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much again to all the panelists. Uh, my name is Noelle. I'm from Johns Hopkins Sice. Good to see a Georgetown peer here as well. Uh, my question has to do with the aspects of digital infrastructure and the way that we can sort of ameliorate those gaps in digital infrastructure between regions on the continent. So as different regions have different needs, different constraints, different strengths, uh, how could a tool like the AFCFTA regime also be leveraged to improve those gaps, other policies and other projects that are ongoing as well? Thank you. Mm. Interesting questions. Thank you. Uh, Henry, you want to start off with the question of uh, <laughs> value uh, addition, all the resources coming from the continent to come and bolster economies out here, but, you know, really nothing benefiting the, the motherland, so to say. Well, I'll go even further. There's, there's no major semiconductor industry in Africa. We're not even part of the conversation, right? Uh, we buy boards from Asia, uh, for example. We're trying to find companies on the continent. I'm not even talking about locally. Mm -hmm. So we're not even part of the conversation. Uh, but that's, that's a leadership, government leadership problem. Uh, we can't blame anybody but ourselves for that problem. Uh, so as far as minerals going out, again, uh, that's, that's above my pay grade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I have my own opinion, but I don't think it matters. But uh, I think we need to develop a, a semiconductor uh, industry, and not just on the, on the country level, but on the continental level, at least regional level, like East Africa, West Africa, and all that. 
that's my, my, my take on it. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree. I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. There, there, is, a, uh, there is a semiconductor company in, uh, in Africa, an African com uh, company in Kenya, uh, small. Uh, so it's a spin off of a university. So they are doing great. So we are trying to cooperate, collaborate. It's, a, it's an initial thing, right? So, so I, I think that there is, it's very below, but we need to, there's some opportunities there. I do think that Africa has a play in, in this for us, in this global semiconductor rebalance. That's what, uh, the journey that Intel is involved with, to rebalance the semiconductor supply chain. And Africa from uh, critical minerals for sure, but needs to be, it, it, it's, it's a different industry. We don't know a lot as Intel about it. We know that we need dramatically, and there's a concentration of a key critical minerals in one country that, I, I mean, if you think about resilience in supply chains, uh, a lot of countries can, can have an opportunity to, to un identify and see what is possible to do in extraction processing and uh, take advantage of that. The second thing that this is what we are doing in Africa, because we do believe that is an opportunity in the sense of uh, the supply chain semiconductor is design. Back to the, the, the possibility to innovate, to create apps, new solutions, uh, design new chips, so on and so forth, why not? So we are putting our uh, Intel labs in conjunction with some uh, few universities across Africa uh, to uh, train uh, their researchers on design 16 nanometers uh, microprocessors. So it's a bet, so let's see, but we do believe that there's a possibility. Rebecca, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the digital divide. I think that was the crux of the question uh, about how do we bridge that digital divide on the continent to ensure equal access to digital skills and uh, opportunities across urban and rural areas. Yeah, just, just before that, I was gonna, I was just thinking also about your question. I won't comment on the semiconductors, but I think behind the question is this other issue of value addition more broadly. Um, and I, I won't comment on the kind of macro, kind of the policy and the macro conditions, but from the ground up, I think that we need to be really intentionally helping businesses and entrepreneurs think about value addition and kind of input substitution and m adding more and more value locally as much as possible. So we do a lot of work in the agribusiness sector. I know we're talking about tech, but why not? Um, you know, where rather than just kind of exporting avocados, we've got entrepreneurs starting to look at avocado oil or kind of other byproducts. So those kind of, I think that, that value addition question is just so critical, not just kind of sending raw materials out, but but keeping more of that value um, within within economies, um, yeah. Yeah, so I guess uh, the last the, the, the second question you. was on the digital divide. Mm. Henry, you want to tackle a little bit? You did. Uh, I think your first question is how, basically, yeah, opportunities, right? The opportunities of the US FTA. Right. FTA. I, I I think it was more really underlying on the issue of uh, bridging the di the digital divide and and some of the opportunities that are available. I mean, I, I think I tap a little bit into it. Uh, I, I'll give you, a, uh, because again, digital divide is not just internet. You have the, the underlying infrastructure, storage, computing power you mentioned. So we, now we're we on a wave in Africa where we're building major data centers. That's great. But data centers really built for big companies, mm -hmm. not startup, not small companies, right? So there's a, there's a need of a new type of infrastructure. That, that's actually the space we are in, where we're building, for example, distributed uh, uh, infrastructure using edge technology, right? It's low cost, but it's really catered to, to, to the small, uh, small companies, startups, even uh, students that want to develop applications, so, uh, so on and so forth. So again, it's, it's part of the inward, looking inward uh, uh, type of mindset where you know, we, we have to stop copy and pasting solution. That's really what our problem is. Mm -hmm. We just copy and paste. We, we, need, we need robust system, which is important, mm -hmm. but we don't adapt it to the ecosystem. And, and actually now with global warming, there's huge impact with data centers now, you know, using massive amount of water, uh, electricity, and so on and so forth, which is also tremendously lacking to a lot of countries. So yeah, I mean, um, the opportunities are there, it's just uh, uh, the approach needs to be different. Mm -hmm. and maybe just to add, I think behind the question as well, it's a really good point that technology connects people fundamentally, right? So um, I think there's, and we see that in, in myriad ways, you know, across the continent on our programs, for example, um, 
COVID allowed us to run virtual programs for entrepreneurs from different parts of the continent. It used to be that we would have to run a Kenyan program in Kenya, a Nigerian program in Nigeria. Suddenly, we were able to bring those entrepreneurs together and we had all these stories of entrepreneurs suddenly doing business with each other in different, you know, we had a, a woman in Kenya with a honey business and a woman in South Africa with a confectionery business and they worked together to create like these honey sweets with honey from Kenya and then they sold them in South Africa. It's like not a very high tech story, but it was very cool, you know, and, and these, you know, these ways that I think for me, that's what's exciting about technology is it connects humans. Um, and, and, and it turns that hustle, it, it amplifies the hustle, I guess, um, and creates more opportunity um, for, you know, for entrepreneurs to create value and have impact. All right. Timekeeper, do we have any more time for questions? One minute. One minute left. <laughs> 30 second question, 30 second response. Good morning, my name is Darnley Howard, president of Advancer International. And to Henri's point about venture capital, uh, I'm wondering if he can talk to the role of African venture capital companies, uh, of which there are a couple, which I know of in, uh, particularly, and maybe they can bridge some of those gaps that you talked about uh, in the venture capital industry. Hi, my name is Wilson Magaya from Zimbabwe. Um, I heard a few statements on infrastructure that enables, uh, and ecosystems that enable uh, entrepreneurship. Our experience, we are a small manufacturing company in Zimbabwe. We realize that the, there is a block of uh, IP transfers, intellectual property. We are making toilets it's very difficult to get the technology to make a toilet pad. And um, we looked into the history of how nations like uh, Korea, Japan, and some places here in the US, and we realized that the infrastructure involved research, and uh, we have these research parks like uh, in North Carolina. As the US government, is there any way that such infrastructure is being built in Africa. That's a, if it is existing somewhere, I think we should then grow it right across the continent, maybe with just four points, east, west, south, north, and then uh, maybe Intel can bring in some of its programs into there. <laughs> I could go on and on, but. Uh, <laughs> All right, thank you. I think that's it. Do you, Fernando, do you want to start with that? Yeah, let, let me start. But it's a great question and both questions. And, and to the, the last one of the infrastructure, right? Yeah, it's missing. Uh, access to a uh, data center, to hardware, to software, it, it, it's costly and it's missing badly in Africa. So what to do and kind of a link into this question and our view also to work with these hubs, the tech hubs in Africa, we have a lot. Uh, Afri Labs has a more than 200 uh, hubs across the continent. But uh, how to connect them, to make them really work together, that they can use the, the tech power they have, that individually is not much, but if we put them together, it can be very helpful. I think this is an opportunity. And then link it to this capacity of these tech hubs, you know, more on the design, but you put the R&D behind, so this idea to work with these universities. And we could see on this, our, uh, this study that we, we, we have there, there's a lot of uh, great researchers in Africa already there. The, the, the universe, again, is how to connect. Uh, uh, that's the, the, the issue, it's not an, an easy one, it's 54 countries, so it's, uh, it's not an, uh, an easy task, but it's the key for Africa to succeed is how to connect to this. And I think that the hubs, the tech hubs, should be a private part, uh, public partnership uh, that we should think together. To Henry, Africa venture capital bridging the gap, the financing gap. Yeah, just to add what Fernando has uh, talked about, I think you mentioned also briefly, um, Africa is lacking tremendously on R&D capital. 
there is no R&D capital that is not subsidized by either a foreign country, which makes no sense to me. Uh, but for the VC, yeah, I mean, the distribution of capital is, is the biggest issue when it comes to VC. So I think uh, last data I checked, 60% uh, goes to FinTech, right? Mm -hmm. Then the rest is spread into health and ed tech. But if, 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 if you're in the infrastructure space, for example, you're looking for patient capital, right? Mm -hmm. VC are not interested in that. They want high growth, 30%, so on and so forth. And African VC bringing that same mindset. I don't blame them. I mean, they, they have people they have to answer to. But I think there's a need of a new capital, you know, vehicle uh, for certain industry. Uh, but distribution of capital is, is, is a big one. Uh, did you want to chime in on that? Oh, I was just going to say, that, like, as well, like success compounds, doesn't it? And um, where you're starting to see some local VCs, particularly in Nigeria, where you've had some big exits, so like Paystack. Um, there's a whole ecosystem around Paystack. When they exited, they kind of there's all these all these spin-offs now, and a lot of the exciting Nigerian startups have come from that ecosystem. Um, so I think it's going to be exciting to watch over the next few years. Hopefully, we're going to get a big exit in Kenya soon. Who knows? Like more in Nigeria, some of other the other ecosystems, and it'll be really exciting to see what comes out of that. As Absolutely, like capital compounds. Many yeah. thanks to all of you, our panelists. Uh, and to all of you for, you know, listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, our panelists.